Hi, welcome to the Online Jewelry Academy. I'm John R. and I'm your instructor. Today we have a special treat for you. We're going to take a field trip to the 1928 Jewelry Factory in Burbank, California. Now this is the only fashion jewelry factory in the Western United States. It's huge. You're going to see everything from mold making, casting, antiquing, soldering, plating, enameling, all the stuff you struggle to do, come watch and see how a team of experts makes it look like magic. And it ends up in a store near you. Come on, let's go. I'm here with Christina Lovejoy. And Christina, could you tell us a little bit about the 1928 Jewelry Company factory? Yes. The 1928 Jewelry Company was founded in 1968. And the owner, Mel Burney, started, uh, as most of us do, in the garage, <laughs> making jewelry by hand and uh, just slowly built the company up from there till in the late 60s he was opening a factory first in downtown LA and then early 70s moved here to our present location in Burbank. The factory is a little over 65,000 square feet and it's 100% vertical. We have every single operation under one roof which allows us a wide skill set as well as very quick reaction time to opportunities and to be able to produce product quickly for ourselves, our customers, uh, the retail stores that we sell to. So it's a, a really incredible place to be. You mentioned that the factory is vertical. Could you explain what that means exactly? Yes, absolutely. The process uh, of manufacturing, developing, designing the jewelry, we have each step covered within our factory. So starting in the design department with a team of designers as well as sample makers for making the prototypes and model makers. So a designer can sketch an original design and then hand that off to the model maker and they would create the model for them. Then once we've created the model we can make multiple castings and hand that off to the sample team who will help make the multiple samples that we'll need for our customers approval, for showrooms and uh, other promotional type of things that you need samples for. Then from that point we have an engineering department. Wow. They will price all of the merchandise that we design. We also have a purchasing department that helps provide us with all the raw materials that we need. We have a production department and they will be able to establish the protocol for manufacturing the item. So we would start, if it had a casting, we would go to the casting department and they would create the mold. So we have our own casting department here. They create the original molds for us. Then we have a assembly department where they can actually assemble soldering, hand assembly. We might jump ring pieces together and then it would go to plating. So we have a plating department. After plating, it might go to a finishing touch like adding antique or patina. Maybe it would have enamel or stone setting. And then after that, we would go to the packaging department where everything gets packaged for retail distribution and then out to the shipping department. So you can come in with an idea and it will follow every single step all the way down the process. So that's why we say it's vertical and leave with finished product that's ready to go to retail. Wow, that's fantastic. So you never have to leave the factory. You never have to leave the factory. And you can probably keep things very quiet or confidential with your clients as well. That's one of the most important aspects uh, for any of the designers that we work with is they want to protect the integrity of their design. And unfortunately, even with the best agreements between factories overseas, there's just very little chance of that. And, and even sometimes when you're outsourcing domestically, if you have to send your castings out to a casting company and you request a couple of hundred castings, there's always a chance they could run that mold a little bit more and get a few for themselves if they wanted to. And, and so yes, to your point, we can protect and preserve the integrity of somebody's unique design by keeping it all under one roof. Wow, that is great. So Christina, we're standing in front of all of this beautiful color and a mixture of different stones and mm -hmm. types of jewelry. Can you explain what we're looking at? Absolutely. Uh, here at the factory, we have a tremendous archive of stones, a lot of raw material resources that 
you can immediately put your hands on when you're developing your ideas and concepts, whether it's trying to create a unique color palette for a new design, or literally able to utilize some of our vintage inventory, uh, really unique components that we have, whether it's a semi-precious stone, Swarovski crystal, even epoxy resin. We have these materials available to not only design with, but in many cases, we actually have stocking quantities on these, some of them tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of units in stock. We have a little over 10,000 different stones and about 5,000 different beads available wow. to use for manufacturing and for product development. So the archive for us is tremendous. And then the other thing that is incredibly special here that I have not seen at too many factories is our ability to custom enamel. We are able to, as we're demonstrating here, Pantone match any color that you bring to us. We work with several fashion brands here in Los Angeles, different apparel manufacturers who will bring us their Pantone swatches seasonally and ask us to make their jewelry match their clothing. So it's something that we're able to do. We also can replicate some really gorgeous techniques. You see examples of guilloche enamel here where you have the detailed pattern in the metal below as well as a transparent enamel in different ombres above. And here you can see the guilloche technique as well on this egg. There's a very detailed textured pattern underneath the transparent enamel, and it appears in light and dark colorations on the surface. We like to show that off. We like to be able to demonstrate the different techniques that we can offer to our customers and for the designers. We use this as a resource. Wow, Christina, this is amazing. Do you mind showing us how it's done in the factory itself? I would love to. Okay, great. So, Christina, we're in the design lab, and can you explain exactly what happens here? Yeah, each one of the designers has their own workstation, like the one we're standing in front of right now. Here they have all of the raw materials, the inspiration, their stones, findings, the components that they're going to need for building and conceptualizing their collections. And as they begin to put pieces together, they will then put them out around the perimeter of the room. We have boards where they can position their finished wares and show them so that we can then decide if it's something that we want to add and make part of their collection. So that usually is around the display, the display area around the perimeter of the room here. They will have it organized either by collection, by group, by color story, depending upon the particular development that we're working on. And um, yeah, this is where the, where the ideas happen. This is where it all starts. So these are all one-of-a-kind pieces at this point? At this point, yes. You're looking at one-of-a-kind pieces. If the collection or the item is selected, then we'll go to our sample room where that one item is duplicated for multiple purposes, uh, for showrooms, for marketing purposes, for PR, for the clients, uh, sales representatives. So at that point, we're taking that one sample and making 10 to 12 pieces, so almost a miniature production facility within oh. our sample department. Can we see that next? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, great. Now we're in the sample making room. Okay. So in here, this is where we make all of our duplicate samples after the designer has created the original sample and it's been approved for production. We will then hand it off to our sample makers here. They know every process and procedure within the factory. They really are a miniature factory in and of themselves. So we can hand them one piece of jewelry and they can turn that into 10, five, 10 pieces of jewelry uh, for us, which we will then use for uh, approval samples, for marketing samples, to go to our showroom, to show our clients. And so that process happens here with the assembly and all of the procedures to create that sample. Wow, that's great. So Christina, I don't want to disturb these women while they're working. Can you show me what they're pulling from to make these beautiful creations? Yeah, let's go. Okay. This is the stock room that we pull from in design for making all of our samples. So when we're designing our collections, we'll come in here to pull for our design concepts but also our sample makers will pull from here to create the production samples. So we have good stocking quantities of really every shape, size, color that you can imagine. We have a large assortment of epoxy stones as well as acrylic, glass, and even some semi-precious. Wow. So you're saying that these are all 
imitation stones. Mm -hmm. So this is really fashion jewelry. Yes. So what's the difference between fashion and fine jewelry? Fine jewelry is going to be made with precious metals. So you're looking at sterling, silver, platinum, gold. We're using less noble metals. We're working with tin or zinc. Uh, sometimes we're using a brass finding. Um, that, and oftentimes a like steel chain. So it's they're less fine metals. They're still nice weight and you can make beautiful construction with them but you're going to need to plate them and finish them. So after we construct something with a tin casting or zinc casting and perhaps a brass binding, we then need to finish the whole piece into a plated metal. So it can have the look of being gold or silver or other precious metals, but in fact the metal underneath is just an inexpensive casting or finding. Well, I'm excited to see the casting. Can we take a look at that? Absolutely. Okay, great. All right. okay. So where are we at now, Christina? Hi, John. We're here with our master model maker, Hermann. And Hermann is currently working on a model for one of our private label customers. This is where all of our models for the castings are created. We can come to Hermann and his team with a sketch or rendering, and they are able to create a model directly in the metal that we'll ultimately be finishing the piece with. This would be another big difference from fine jewelry where typically they would work and make a model in wax. Here, because of our casting process, our model will actually go directly into the rubber mold and create the foundation piece for all of the castings that we manufacture. So. It's uh, wonderful to be able to see and feel the finished model and make sure that it functions. And it's pretty hardy and sturdy after you're done building the, the metal model here. So how many models have you made over the years? A little over 35,000 unique models in the 45 years that the company has been in business. Let's go to the casting archive. Okay, I'd like that. It seems like Herman and his staff have made quite a few models for you. And are they all here? Yeah, this, this uh, archive that you see here represents all 35,000 models that we've made over the last 45 years. What you can see is a little unique and sometimes challenging for a designer to work from because they're organized chronologically. As each model is finished, one casting is glued to the board and assigned a unique model number. That will then become the identifying number for that model and casting from here on out. That's great. And I can see there's a huge variety. Can we see how they're cast? Yeah, let's go to casting next. Okay. Wow, Christine, it's really hot in here. What's going on in here? We're in the casting department, John. Uh, as you can see in the corner there, we've got the hot pots filled with metal. This is actually a molten pewter, and it's a little over 770 degrees right now. As you can see, the metal can be ladled directly into the centrifuge and as the rubber mold is spinning, the metal is now migrating to every cavity inside that mold. Wow, it looks like it chills really fast. Yeah, the metal starts to cool down quickly. It's deceptive because it gets uh, hard quite quickly, but it will still be very hot to the touch for at least a good 10, 15 minutes. So you have a lot of waste material that they're pulling off, I see. Can you just put it directly back into the hot pot? Yeah, that is a, a great feature of pewter. You don't have to do any refining. We can take all of the excess metal from the casting process and put it right back into the hot pot. You only need to add new blocks of metal from time to time to uh, refresh as you're using the metal. But all of the waste material can be easily recycled. These are such interesting molds, Christina. I've never seen anything like them. I see somebody working on one over here. Can you explain what he's doing? Yes. Right now what he's doing is preparing a new rubber mold with new production castings. As you can see, there's at least 30 to 40 castings that he'll be plotting out to fit inside this rubber mold. They have to be spaced concentrically in a circle. So right now he's cutting the raw rubber the rubber right now is very soft. You can see he's cutting it with an exacto knife, placing it underneath the casting, and he's moving his spacing stick all the way around the mold. Eventually, it'll be like a clock or a dial with a position for each and every casting, and we'll create a gate system 
for when the metal is poured inside the mold, it will funnel out to each one of these cavities. And after he cuts it, we will then put the two halves of the rubber mold together and move it over to the vulcanizer. The vulcanizer is those round discs over there, large round plates. And what they'll do is once the mold is inside the vulcanizer, with heat and pressure, we'll actually be able to cook the mold so that it becomes hard enough for us to start casting. Kind of like making a tire. Yes, exactly. Can you show me what happens next? John, this is where our jewelry comes to get clean. Over here is our ceramic tumbler. The castings will go in here raw, and with a little bit of soapy water and vibration, the ceramic media will remove the casting skin and create a uniform finish on the outside of the casting. I see a lot of individual pieces, but they don't look very wearable. How do you attach findings to them? Well, many times we have to do multiple assembly processes, and in this case, right here, what you see going on is soldering. She's joining a lever back ear hook finding in brass to the pewter casting. And as you can see, she has to have a very delicate touch with the torch. She has a wide open flame. She's melting the low uh, easy solder into each casting first so that she has it positioned. And then she's... Sweat soldering. Sweat soldering, yeah. Okay. Do you use any cold connections at the plant in order to manufacture these items? Yes, we are fortunate to have jump ring machines here at the factory which can turn spools of different gauge wire into a machined jump ring that is able to create a, preci a precision join that can join chains, clasps, and other castings together to create a finished item like a bracelet, an earring, or necklace. I've noticed that the piece that she's working on has multiple colors of metal on it and that it's primarily copper. Right now what you see is all the raw base metal. Once the piece has been joined together with the raw brass jump rings, you have copper coated steel chain, a raw brass lobster clasp, all of these elements come together and then will be sent to the plating department to receive one uniform finish. Wow, the mechanization for the jump rings is great, but I'm sure you have to do something by hand, don't you? You do. When you're making a more complex assembly, perhaps chain to casting, you would need to then open the chain by hand and join that to create a more uniform transition between the casting and the chain itself. Uh, sometimes jump rings won't provide that kind of nice transition. So yeah, we do a lot of hand assembly here as well. So this is the finishing department, right? Yes. John, this is where our jewelry comes to get dirty. Over here at the antiquing table, we're adding a black wash over top of the plated surface. What this does is creates an enhanced patina to the overall glossy, shiny surface that exists after the plating process. This helps to bring out the details and definition in the casting. So you get a lot more depth. Yes. I see that she's just tumbled the pieces in a dry tumbling media to clean off some of the wet patina that was applied. All of the mechanized processes involved in finishing the pieces are amazing to see. And I like that big screen she's using to sift the tumbling media out so that we can see the pieces. And all of the pieces are looking really good. But these look like they could use a few stones in them. John, let's go look at glue. Christina, I noticed that your workers are putting stones into the jewelry, and it looks like they're gluing them in, but I don't see any of the glue. Can you explain what's going on? The glue has already been put into each one of the settings. We do it in a two-part process, so there's no contamination. So only one person handles the glue, and only one person handles the stones. She has a little piece of red sticky wax on the end of her glue syringe here, and she's using the sticky wax to pick up the stones with, uh, at, the, at the top of the table, and then she's placing them down inside the setting. After she's done that on every single item, she will then inspect with the white cup to make sure she hasn't missed any settings. All of the pieces are adhered to the board with a double-sided sticky tape 
which keeps them stabilized as you move them from the work surface to the drying surface. What's the next part of the process? Uh, Armida is checking all of the, the castings to make sure that the stones are sitting exactly in the setting. The glue has already been applied and now she's making sure that they're just shown in every setting. She's blocking out any excess glare by utilizing the little white cup here. She's able to look through the bottom of the cup and only isolate the stone. And now with the little pick, she's touching and testing and making sure that each stone is sitting flush in the setting. Wow, that's interesting. Let's go to the next place. Let's go over to enamel. Lupe is enameling this necklace right now. She's filling in the cavity in the center of the stone with an opaque green enamel. The viscosity of this enamel is such that we can create a dome surface that will give the illusion of a cabochon stone. This enables us to create custom colors for any of our clients. The enamel takes about 24 hours to harden completely. And as you can see, the enamel works nicely on a curved surface. It's interesting how the enamel can be either opaque or transparent, and the colors are great. We've seen so many interesting processes today. What's the next step for these beautiful pieces of jewelry? Here we are in the retail store, and this is the end result of all that hard work. Beautiful jewelry, packaged and ready for retail. And I'm sure this isn't all of it. No, we have a little over 5,000 active SKUs. Wow, so that means you're servicing stores all over the world? Absolutely. Wow, thank you so much for taking us on a tour thank of the factory. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you for watching. Check out our other videos and products on the onlinejewelryacademy.com.